fellow citizens. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. More than 35 countries are giving crucial support, from the use of naval and air bases, to help with intelligence and logistics, to the deployment of combat units. Every nation in this coalition has chosen to bear the duty and share the honor of serving in our common defense. To all the men and women of the United States Armed Forces now in the Middle East, the peace of a troubled world and the hopes of an oppressed people now depend on you. That trust is well placed. The enemies you confront will come to know your skill and bravery. The people you liberate will witness the honorable and decent spirit of the American military. In this conflict, America faces an enemy who has no regard for conventions of war or rules of morality. Saddam Hussein has placed Iraqi troops and equipment in civilian areas, attempting to use innocent men, women, and children as shields for his own military, a final atrocity against his people. I want Americans and all the world to know that coalition forces will make every effort to spare innocent civilians from harm. A campaign on the harsh terrain of a nation as large as California could be longer and more difficult than some predict. And helping Iraqis achieve a united, stable, and free country will require our sustained commitment. We come to Iraq with respect for its citizens, for their great civilization, and for the religious faiths they practice. We have no ambition in Iraq except to remove a threat and restore control of that country to its own people. I know that the families of our military are praying that all those who serve will return safely and soon. Millions of Americans are praying with you for the safety of your loved ones. What is going on, everyone? This is Dominic with the Veterans the Den Podcast, a.k.a. The for Dominator. Yourself. That was President Bush making the announcement to the country that we are at war with Iraq and coalition forces and troops are in Iraq. But I remember, I don't know about you guys, but I remember being on the border of Kuwait and Iraq waiting to go in on the 19th. And sometime after 10, 18 or 11, 18, we actually went in. So the war actually started uh, before that. And I know the bombardment started happening like after midnight and all that stuff but um so anyway let me let me before we get into that because i do want to talk about the iraq war because last week was last week saturday was the anniversary of the iraq war which happened 18 years ago and i was trying to do a podcast i know i told you guys every wednesday i would try to do a podcast and send it out to you guys or post it or whatever um, I was at home with the family or I was back home with the family in Los Angeles. It was just really hard to do and it just wasn't going to come out right. And, you know, of course, I don't want to give you guys a garbage podcast, but that's why I was not able to do it. And then fast forward, I've been kind of busy. And then last night I tried doing it after I got off of work and I was just exhausted. <laughs> so here I am in uh, in the morning. It's 725 my time here in Arizona trying to knock this out for you guys but going back to the Iraq war like I said I remember roughly about eight or nine o'clock we were dug into our little makeshift bunkers or little holes in the floor um, because they started the 155 mic mics or the howitzers started dropping indirect fire on a large force that was on the other side of the the border and to me, that pretty much kicked it off because it was going on for a couple of hours. And then I remember getting the word that to load up, you know, jump in our convoy and, and we just headed in, you know. And we took a lot of uh, small arms attack fire RPGs because I think the bombardment of the howitzers kind of made everybody kind of scared, the, the Iraqi forces. So they immediately retreated back to their next 
um, I don't know, rally point or whatever they had. But I remember I was, how old was I? I was 21 at the time. I turned 21 out there. So I guess we'll start from the beginning. I was in Port Wainimi, California. So, so in case you, in case you don't know, we're going to talk about the Iraq war and the anniversary and everything that I've dealt with, with that. And also what you guys may have dealt with. So back in, let's say December of, was it 2002? Um, I left Port Wainimi, California. Actually, I was on a field exercise and we got the word to like mount up and can next, uh, field exercise and we loaded up our gear and off we went we were there um it was kind of funny because the grinder or what we call the formation area where but for navy where we have our muster the grinder that we have our muster and formation on was the same exact grinder that my dad retired out of a year prior you know my dad retired 21 years or 20 years uh 20 years and he left the military, had the big ceremony right there on the same grinder. Fast forward, actually I lied, not one year, two years. Fast forward two years, and there I am in the middle of the night loading up a bus to get on a plane to Kuwait. And on the way there, it was uh, our plane had a problem, our plane broke down. So we landed in, where did we land? I want to say Maryland. We landed in Maryland. And it was heavy snow. It was bad weather. And there we are in all this uh, summer fatigues and desert fatigues. And they had to put us up in a hotel, which was nice. And uh, I think a couple of our buddies put up signs that said, which way to the desert, <laughs> you know, or which way to Iraq. And we had pictures of it. I don't know where, where my pictures are of that. But after that, I finally got up finally got up and running and then we made our way back to um kuwait not back to we made our way to kuwait once we were there we landed we immediately went to el jabber i think i stayed there for like eight hours nine hours then i was on a convoy to the border uh close to the border close to the border of iraq and kuwait and our job there was to lay out like a supply camp so our job was to put up uh, defensive berms roads and all that other stuff so we made makeshift road with clay and dirt and all that just stuff that cbs do but um that was pretty that was pretty fun i actually enjoyed that that part i enjoyed i think we we're all just having fun enjoying it and because it was a small group of us our main body wasn't there yet and then we later on had the word to go out to the border the actual border right there on the border of Kuwait and Iraq in the beginning of March and there we sat pretty much just sat day in and day out just waiting and waiting waiting the classic military hurry up and wait and it was very intense I think the laughter and all that kind of not totally died down it got more serious kind of talking about like sitting around people talking about their wills you know like how they want their funeral <laughs> this and that you know just very crazy stuff that military people would talk about you know, that probably would be frowned upon with a normal conversation out in public. But for us, it was normal. It was like, whatever. And then uh, fast forward on March 19th, like I said, that's when they started the bombardment. And I remember we were all on edge because it just happened out of nowhere. They just started doing the bombardment. We're just sitting around. We didn't even get word that they're going to start doing that. And it was the Marines. The Marines were out there with their 155 mic mics launching them off. And then... We, when that happened, we thought we we're getting bombed. So we turned around, we started uh, jumping in our holes and just laying there and like trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Then we, then we, I think we, I don't know if someone told us what was going on. Or we just kind of figured it out on our own. Like, oh yeah, you know, we're, we're kicking this off. Um, I do know sirens were going off because they started launching Scud missiles uh, into Kuwait. And sometime about 10, 18, 11, 18, we got the word to move in. And like I said, we were met with small arms fire in the middle of the night. Nothing nothing big, um, just small arms fire. Um, like I said, the large force got bombarded, so either they got wiped off, wiped off the map, or they were, they were retreating or whatever they do. 
most most time retreating. <laughs> but you know, during that during the Iraq War in general, you know, it was, it was pretty intense for be a twenty one year old who grew up a Navy brat uh, throughout his life. Then you know, right from high school, going straight into the military. You know, I was very much a kid. You know, I was very much a child. You know, like uh, uh, still had a little bit of innocence left in me. But of course, after after the Iraq War, that kind of got taken away. But um, you know, looking back and reflecting on it, I wish, I wish I could go back in time and just tell that person, like you know, everything's gonna be okay. You know, because I think uh, I'm not afraid to say it. I was scared. You know, because I never dealt with anything like this in my life. I was a young kid. But at the same time, I just did my job. You know, I faced it, uh, faced my fears, whatever you want to call it. And I just did my job. You know, uh, I looked after my buddies. I looked after my crew. I, I drove a uh, a Vietnam era aluminum can uh, deuce and a half troop carrier. So I kind of accepted the fate that I would be bombed <laughs> at some point during the war because, you know, I had a, I was a troop carrier, I had troops. So I was a prime target, you know. So I just kind of accepted the fate that I was going to die sometime during the war. And especially being in an aluminum can and, you know, IED, as you fast forward in the war, IED started becoming a big thing. You know, we had no armor plating on any of our vehicles, you know, stuff like that. You know, a lot of ingenuity happened when we were just slapping on metal onto vehicles, whatever we could, you know, to make it stronger. But yeah, you know, I just kind of accepted the fate and I just did what I did me and my shotgun driver we used to just crack jokes while we're driving you know making light of it you know and uh at times you know it was scary you know I remember having a uh an attack of RPGs and and I think uh mortars or some kind of sm- indirect fire had to be mortars um it was coming down on us and you know just having to just take it as it is you know especially if you're on uh flat land and or i don't even remember being on top of a hill you know there's nowhere to go we're on top of a hill flat land and uh there we were you know so where were you where were you when when uh bush made the announcement what were you doing um were you in the war were you at home were you just in school you know especially those that are listening on my my youtube channel go ahead and put in the comments what what were you doing when that announcement happened um i know for my family they they were glued to the tv because they knew we were going to go to war especially my dad my dad was calling all his buddies because you know he just retired like less than two years prior so he's calling all his buddies his buddies were telling him like yeah i think his unit is here i think his unit's there i think his unit's in country already you know stuff like that you know so my family stayed glued to the tv and i know my mom my dad uh, stayed up all day and night just with CNN on, you know, just watching, you know, every day. But uh, when the announcement was made, we were already pretty much in Baghdad, already fighting. Uh, Scud missiles were being launched. Bombardments were happening. We were dropping bombs on them. And it just went into it, you know. And I think the second or third day is when we got hit with a huge sandstorm, you know, in never dealt with any of that in my whole life too so that was that was also rare for me you know i never dealt with the sandstorm so because of that like it was it was pretty rough because we were still fighting they were still like just blind firing because they knew we were on one side and we're on the other side or they're on one side and we're on the other side so they know if they pull the trigger that a bullet was bound to hit one of us or at least be in our direction so that was pretty intense you know i remember uh the first night we camped during that sandstorm, somebody left their tent open. They got buried in sand. You know, that was funny, but they also were underneath their sleeping bag, so they were able to sleep <laughs> during the whole thing. But I think after that, what happened? We, uh, I know we got hit with two Scud missiles in our area. And, uh, and, and also, too, we were attached to the, we were part of the 1st MEF, and we fell under the 7th Marine Regiment, the infantry out of uh, 29 Palms. So, basically, for the CBs, our job was to make sure the infantry has a straight shot to Baghdad. So, in Baghdad, there's all these canals and rivers, and our job was to build bridges on them that can hold heavy armored equipment and tanks. You know, not the not the type uh, the Army has, the little uh, quick bridges that they just 
load up on a tracked vehicle that they just drop over thing. Our, ours was supposed to be more heavy reinforced, and, and I believe they were called Bailey Bridges. Um, but that was our job, you know. So fast forward again, uh, we finally make. Oh, actually, let me. There was a story. There's another story. During the battle for Fallujah, we were on the outskirts towards the east. And it was just us and not totally sure, of course, you know, because I'm not part of the the, uh, head shed or the chain of command or the brass, you know, but for whatever reason, we're we're far, not too far because we can actually see the battle going off in the distance. Uh, I believe I could be wrong, but I know that this was during the major battle of Fallujah when we first entered. What ended up happening is we got a call. We got an intel report that. A large Iraqi force of over a thousand light armed um, vehicles of Iraqi forces and soldiers were coming our way. Like just spear, spear, you know, spearing straight for us. And that was, um, I want to say the, the 10th or the 11th night, I think. And I could be wrong. It's been a while. And, I didn't, and I'm just, like I said, I don't, if, I don't know if you guys seen in my last podcast, I don't really have a script, I kind of just go off of what I feel and, and my thoughts and kind of freestyle everything, but, um, and I could be wrong, but I want to say pr- pretty much the second week, we were up on top of a hill, and we actually just got bombed, that's the time when I was saying we are getting bombed and mortared, and we're on top of this hill, flat land, so you can clearly see us, you know, there's no hiding us, um, but whatever the commander said, this would be the best spot to set up camp for the night. So, of course, we circled the vehicles at the top and we had our defensive perimeter towards the downslope of the hills. And we got word in the middle of the night that there was a large Iraqi force coming straight for us. And they think that what it was, it was going to be a flanking maneuver or something like that. And we end up calling for air support because there was only, I think there was only 240 of us, 250 of us. And this force was over a thousand. So we started calling on the radios like, hey, can we get our support? Can we get a recon? All that other stuff, you know, reconnaissance flight over so we know exactly what we're dealing with. But all assets were being utilized for Fallujah. So the only thing we got was, and I, and I mean the only thing we got, I don't, I don't mean that as a bad thing, but the, what we got was a, a small unit of 89 bulk few Marines. Um, I, I don't know who they were attached to or what they were, but I knew they were bulk room Marines. They came in, reinforced, and, you know, good old Marines, they just want to pick a fight, too. So they're like, hey, there's a fight over there. Let's go over there. <laughs> Hell, yeah. You know? So got to love my Marine brothers. Um, but, uh, yeah, so there we are, sitting in the middle of the night. They sent out an LPOP up ahead, which I thought was crazy, you know, because they're sending two guys out, to, and basically their job was just to let us know when the enemy was coming, you know, but they're in their front lines. So we sat there and waited, and it was like a big battle that never happened. We sat there and waited and waited and waited, and I guess that they couldn't find us. Even though we're coming straight for us, they couldn't find us, and they figured out that we would have hit them already, and they just kind of made a left turn, you know, and they just went off that way, you know, and then uh, the battle never happened, you know, and that was pretty intense. For me, that was pretty intense because we're just waiting and waiting waiting. We're sitting there in the dark. I remember our... uh, Gunnies, or not our gunnies, uh, our gunner's mates were going around um, giving out ammo and grenades, hand grenades like candy, like here, here you go, here you go, here you go, this, here, take some of this. And then on top of that, our every every battalion has a, a gunny attached to them. And they're supposed to be like the, the marine liaison, but they're also supposed to be the the advisor, the tactical advisor, you know. So they speak Marine and they also make sure that uh, we are set up the right way that can be integrated with the Marine Corps. You know, because uh, the CBs, if you didn't know, we follow the the basic rifleman's guide or infantry guide um, for the Marine Corps. That's what the whole CBs is based off of when it comes to formations, platoon, LPOPs, all that stuff. Convoys, ADRACs, SMEACs, salute reports, spot reports. We, we follow the same thing as as the the Marine Corps does. So anyway, he was going in, like, saying, this is what we need. We're going to put this cruiser weapon over here. 
put that Mark 19 over there, do this, do that, do that. You know, and then we had our mortar set up and we're just ready, you know, and we're all ready. Uh, for me, it was pretty intense because I'm like, damn, this is about to get crazy, you know. And it never happened. And I think we were all on edge. Sunrise came. We just got the word to like, all right, mount up. Let's go. Keep going. So there we were going once again uh, on the road to Baghdad. And when we finally got into Baghdad, we, we didn't hit a lot of fire. Um, we didn't get a lot of attacks. Um, pretty much the Marines wiped out a lot of the major forces and armored vehicles. All we dealt with was a small arms attacks, you know, just people popping out of windows, you know. A couple of people stood their ground and actually went toe-to-toe with us, you know. Um, but then after that, you know, it was kind of, once we got into Baghdad and we, like, dropped the statues and all that in the Baghdad Center, you know, all of it kind of just mellowed, not mellowed out, but it just wasn't as bad. You just dealt with the small guys, these small pockets of resistant forces, like these onesies, twosies guys. And then we were in Baghdad for a while. We stayed at a stadium, a soccer stadium. And then on top of that, it was a uh, military training ground for them, for their for their army. Once we moved out of there, we headed, I, I don't know what direction we headed to, but we left. And we went to another military compound that was on the outskirts of Baghdad. And on that day, I remember, I remember offloading the Marines with a 12K, a Lift King 12K. I was getting off all their gear because we were going to just set up camp there for now until we figure out what's the next, you know, next step, you know, what's our next job, you know, to do. So then we were clearing out, we were, we set up camp on this flat open land. And in the morning we realized this wasn't a good idea. There was abandoned buildings that were concrete and brick. We're like, that would be a better, you know, place to set up camp because we can have protection, you know, can see, uh, uh, at least cover. So while I was offloading the Marines, my other buddy, uh, reservist who I won't say names, I'll say why after <laughs> I won't get, I won't say any names. He, um, was people were loading up, uh, their bags or equipment inside of his uh, front end loader and was moving it from the flat ground to into the compound. So the only thing that was left at the end of all this was my gear and his gear. So I go up and I loaded his bag, loaded my bag. And all of a sudden we, there was an RPG that shot over and we started getting attacked by small arms. He freaks out because of the RPG almost hit the cab and jumps out. But what he did is he accidentally, I don't know, maybe mental, you know, for, for EOs, it is mental, uh, muscle memory that when you get out of the vehicle, you drop all your attachments, drop your bucket, you know, all that stuff and put it in park. So I think what happened was muscle memory for him. He put it in park and he dropped the front end loader bucket and it landed right on top of my foot and he left. So there I am pinned down. You got CBs and Marines on one side. You have uh, the Iraqi forces on the other attacking us. And it was intense. And I vaguely remember I was in and out um, because I was just in a lot of pain. Um, What kind of saved my foot is that it rained that night. So the ground was very soft and wet. So what I ended up doing is that the weight of the bucket kind of just pushed my foot down into the mud. Because the mud was really soft. So I think that's what saved I ended up getting like uh, fractures and on the top of my foot and also just blood rushing to the side of my foot or something like that, that I remember. So after all of that, after being pinned down, you know, getting shot at and stuff and kind of making my peace with God, I end up kind of passing out, taken to the medical tent. I woke up, passed out again, woke up, passed out again. And I think what it was is they were just kind of filling me up with drugs because it wasn't totally sure what was wrong with me. Um, they knew something happened to my foot. They didn't take my shoe off because they wanted to keep everything together. And, the, and then I, I remember waking up being taken to uh, a Humvee to get medevac. So I got to some other camp where they were doing medical evacuations. And when I was there, I waited, I think, about an hour. After that, I was loaded onto a helicopter then. We're on the tarmac, or I call it a tarmac. I don't know what they call it for for helos, maybe a, a landing pad. But either way, we were there, and we ended up getting attacked again. The, the front gate got attacked, and mortars started coming down. 
and there I am on a stretcher and what happened is the flight crew or the medical crew I don't know who it was they like they dropped the the bed or the stretcher and took cover and there I am on the open flat ground right next to the helicopter not only that it was I think they're called Canucks and if I'm wrong it's the one with the two propellers on the top but the Canuck I'm in the back of the Canuck and I'm getting roasted because one it's kind of warm already and hot you know it's pretty hot it's morning time it's about to get hot it's like really warm really hot um and the exhaust from the Canuck is just right on me cooking me and I got pissed I started yelling at the at the medic guys or whatever and I started rolling I started rolling like a like a roly poly over to a little little berm that was right near it, around the the Canuck and so I was just mad and pissed I started yelling at him once I got to there and pretty much after that I got loaded up uh only other thing was is uh only other thing is that when we we're in a helicopter the doc the medical guy stepped right on my foot and I was screaming in pain and and I punched him um but yeah, uh, I got medevac, went to southern Kuwait. From southern Kuwait, I flew to Spain. Was in Spain for a couple of weeks, and I flew to Washington, D.C., then to Chicago, and then to Miramar, from Miramar to Camp Pendleton. And then after a couple of days staying in Camp Pendleton, I was uh, sent to Port Wayne, back home. So, uh, I think... Another thing, too, is when I first realized my very first PTSD episode happened when I was in when I was in Spain, we dropped someone outside the tent because it was a makeshift medical tent in Spain in Rota, Spain. Someone dropped a generator and it was actually CB's uh, dropped a generator, landed on the ground, made a loud bang. I freaked out, jumped out of the bed and tried flipping the the bed I was on and it kind of, kind of flipped kind of, I, they had to tie it down a certain way or not tied down. I don't know how they do it, but it just didn't flip right. It kind of flipped at an angle, Do- dove underneath it and was just taking cover, you know? And you know, it's crazy. I had a moment of like, what the hell is going on? You know, like, why am I doing this? And I looked around and there was two army guys and a Marine that did the same thing. You know, the other guys were just still in bed, but it was us four that were underneath the, the beds, you know, and I think that's when, that was my very first PTSD moment, you know, um, so then fast forward, you know, since then, you know, since the war happened, uh, officially they say the war ended December 15th, um, 2011. And I was actually there. I was part of NSW. I, got rid of a lot of equipment and convoy stuff from our camps in Iraq to Kuwait and pretty much was part of the shutdown and the ending of all that. So I was also part of that. So what's crazy is I was part of the beginning in March 20th, 2003 or March 19th, 2003. And there I was at the ending in December 15, 21, 2011. So where are we at now? You know, I remember, I remember on the 10 year anniversary, 10 year anniversary, I was going to work. I will, for those of you um, that live in California or specifically Southern California, I was on Lambert Road heading to Brea, California, where I worked. And I don't want to say where I worked, but it was a, it was a military slash law enforcement tactical store that sold gear and guns strictly to military and law enforcement only. So I'm on my way there and I'm listening to a radio and it just hit me and they talked about on the radio that it was a 10 year anniversary and I don't know what it was about that. They were talking about, you know, how many people have died, um, everything that was going on. They played a, uh, a clip from Bush's, uh, announcement to the world. And I remember I just started crying. I started crying and I don't know why it, even I, I was just confused why I was crying. It just hit me hard. And I'm on my way to work and I actually end up parking like a block away from work because I was like sad, you know, I was really sad. I think part of it was the, the ones we lost, you know, because I did during, during that time, like I said, I lost my buddy, not in, uh, 2004 and my buddy Adams in 2004, one was in Kuwait, one was in Albania with me. Um, 
one was combat, one was construction, you know, and I just thought of everything. I just thought of everything. Um, I kind of reflected that I did have PTSD and I like thought of everything that happened to me and what triggers me here at home. And so for whatever reason, I just started crying and I even tried telling my boss like, Hey, I can't come in. I'm having a bad moment right now. I explained that today was the 10 year anniversary and it's hitting me hard for some reason. And he pretty much said, Oh, well, get to work. You know, you better come in or else we're going to fire you. And that's when I also realized that no one cares. (laughs) There's going to be some people in this world that don't give a damn, you know, what anniversary it is. And it was just rough, you know? And then with everything going on, um, People talked more about it. So fast forward again. I remember it being like 2017, maybe even 2016, that no one said nothing about the anniversary of the Iraq war except one one radio station that I was listening to and I was driving. And they talked about it. They just said, oh, you know, by the way, today's uh, anniversary since the, the war in Iraq and this and that when the war started. And that was it. That was literally it. And I thought about that because then I got another memory that on TV, they announced there was the Vietnam anniversary and I thought about it. I'm like, wow, you know, like the Vietnam war was a big thing. And now look at us. We barely talk about it. We don't say much about it or anything, you know, and I'm thinking like, well, how many years will it be till we just, you know, no one talks about the Iraq war, you know, sure enough, last week, I didn't hear nothing, I was watching the news, I was watching, and I could, and, you know, I could be wrong, it just could be timing, maybe they talked about it on the news, and then two minutes later, I turn on TV, and they're not talking about it, but last week, Thursday, there wasn't talked about on the radio, it wasn't talked about on, on the news coverage or anything, and I actually had a moment where I kind of was sad, like, you know, this is this shouldn't be forgotten. Like I was there, you know. I saw things. I saw things that I can never remove from my head. You know, this should not be forgotten. You know, especially everything that so many went through, men and women. Uh, the U.S. forces on our side, you know, that passed away in combat. It's it should shouldn't be forgotten. You know, and and we're not even talking about it you know even now there's not there's I think it was 18,000 over 18,000 since the beginning to end that passed away but I think they also grouped that in with the Iraq war and the global war on terrorism but but yeah you know here we are you know not talking about it already so is this rough you know, I always, always take March 19th um, hard. I, I know, like I said, I know the anniversaries. If you look in the books and everything, oh, we went to war on, on the 20th. But, you know, I was there. I was there on the front line. Uh, shit was kicking off on the 19th, and we went in before midnight, either at 1018 or 1118, you know. But, like I said, where were you? Where were you when all this happened? Where were you... When Bush made the announcement, what happened at home when everything was going on and the war was happening. For those of you that were in the military, that served, that were there, where were you? What do you remember? Um, What was your thoughts when you came back? You know, for me, I didn't make heads or tails of anything. And it wasn't until almost a year later that I was in a store. And I saw a book that was put out. I can't, I can't remember who it was like CNN or uh, NBC or something like that. They put out this book that also came with the DVD came with the DVD. And it was a book of everything that happened during the Iraq war, you know, everything. And I remember looking through pictures and just being like, in awe of like all the awesomeness and power that we did, but also saddened by some of the stuff I saw, you know, all the hurt people, all the hurt U S forces and all that. 
And I remember the DVD I put on. I saw the DVD and I instantly started crying because I just was in shock. You know, like I didn't know, you know, when you're when you're on the on the front lines, when you're, you know, with with doing your thing, you like you don't think of anything. You don't think of the big picture. All you care about is the guy to the next to you, the guy to the left, to the right of you and your and your team, your your CBs, your Marines. You know, you just want to protect them, watch their back and do what you got to do. But for some odd reason, for whatever reason, it kind of hit me hard. Again, just like the 10 year anniversary that also hit me hard. And I think that has to do with my PTSD. You know, I think of all that stuff and everything that we all went through. Um, you know, people go and, and they're not the same. They were never the same when we came back. You know, we're not, you know, the stuff that we've been through is with us till the day we die. You know, it'll never go away. It's just a part of us. And I think that was my first time actually seeing the whole big picture, the whole battlefield, the whole everything, everything that was happening. Because like I said, even now I try to look up uh, news reports and also try to look up stuff on the Internet to find out where exactly we were. I know we came from the South, but I want to follow the trail that we did, you know, because. I was a young kid. I was just more focused, like, just give me orders and I'll do it. You know, I didn't say, hey, look, we're over here. Hey, look, we're we're uh, in Fallujah. Hey, look, we're in South Baghdad and we're we're over here. We're over there. You know, I just was this tunnel vision. Just do your job. Stay alive. Do your job. Protect your guys. Do your job. Uh, keep fighting, you know, and fast forward. Now I want to know everywhere I went. I want to know the trail I followed going into there. And it's hard. It's hard. I can't find it. I have an idea of where other major units and some units that we we're attached to or near. So I kind of have an idea. But yeah, this it's uh, 18 years, 18 years, you know, since the Iraq war. But, you know, it, it definitely doesn't get easier. I guess it does, you know, because I'm able to talk about it. I kind of. Had a hard time talking about it last week, but now I'm able to. And who knows, maybe last year I wouldn't have been able to if I did a podcast last year or the past two years or whatever. Um, it is a little easier to talk about, you know, especially because I want to talk about it and start a conversation with you guys. You know, not that we can have a direct conversation, but definitely just to hear your thoughts if, if you're able to post in the comments, you know. and Or just in general, wherever you're at, wherever you're listening to this, you know. How has the Iraq war affected you? Did you did you feel like a part of you is left in Iraq? Because I know I do. I feel like there's a part of me in Iraq that I'll never get back. You know, and even then, like me being in Medivac made me feel like crap. Made me feel like shit, like I was leaving my guys, you know. So even more so, I feel like there's a part of me that um, will always be there. There's even a part of me that would love to go back. I don't know, go back to Iraq or go back to the time, but either or, or both, you know, just, you know, send me, send me with my guys again and I'll do it, you know, and I know that's the sentiment with a lot of guys. I have even talked to Vietnam guys. I said, I would love to go to Iraq. I would love to go there and fight with you guys and be side by side with you guys, even, even Korean war vets and, and world war two vets. And I think, I think that's the beauty of the military. I think that's the beauty of the veterans is that, no matter how old we get, no matter how much PTSD we have, uh, we're not afraid to go back and fight with our brothers and sisters. You know, we're not afraid to stand up and, and deal with things. And that's the beauty of it. That's why I love the military. That's why I love the the veteran community. You know, the there's no expiration date on our oath of enlistment. But... Well, there you go. There's the there's a podcast episode for you. Um, actually, got to go get ready for the Coffee and Freedom show. Um, I'm part of, like I told you guys in the last podcast, I'm part of a morning show that goes Tuesdays and Thursdays. You can catch it on live on Facebook. Um, Coffee and Freedom. Um, that's what you search for. So check it out. Also, too, to clear up some things. No, I'm not a Navy SEAL. I'm a Navy CB who did a lot of SEAL team support and Naval Special Warfare support. Um, I got I got a couple of people asking, hey, I, I didn't know you're a SEAL, or you're really a SEAL, you know, kind of challenging me, which I get, you know, but no, I'm not I'm not a SEAL. 
I'm a Navy CB, totally different. But yeah, uh, check me out there. Check me out on my Instagrams. Um, but yeah, 18 years, man, 18 years. Would I go back and do it again? Fuck yeah, I would. I'll do it in a heartbeat. I would. Would you Would you tell me that hey, there's a possible chance if you go back again, you could die? I don't care. Fuck it. I'd rather rather die in combat than slip on a bar of soap in the bathtub and die. <laughs> you know. Um. But yeah, if I could, I would definitely would share those moments with my brothers and sisters out there one more time. Um. Yeah. So there you have it. There's a podcast. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I will definitely try to stick to what I say about doing these on Wednesdays, but roughly about Wednesday. If I don't make it Wednesday, then I guess Thursday, but I will try and have this podcast up for you guys to listen to. Um, after I do my morning show, which my morning show that I do with my buddies starts in 14 minutes. So after I'm done with that, I'm going to do my edits and I'll get this out to you on Spotify. I'm still working on getting it on Apple podcast, but I should have it on other platforms. I'll definitely promote it on my outlets, uh, especially on the, on the YouTube channel. I'll uh, put it up there for you guys, but I hope you guys have a good day and I will catch you all next week. Be safe. Have a good weekend. And, you know, God bless all those we lost in the Iraq war. Um, many blessings to their families because I know they probably still feel it every March or the anniversary of when they pass. But um, prayers and love to all you guys. Um, prayers to your hearts and all that. And yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna check out before I start getting all emotional and stuff. <laughs> um, but thank you. Thank you for listening. I will check you guys out next week and we'll talk about something else. So take care, have a good weekend and be good to one another. Check you all out. And like I always say at the end of my videos and podcasts, carry on. <laughs>